Okay, chapter five. A force is a push or a pull. Here's someone pushing a shot put. A force acts on an object. Okay, because pushes or pulls are always applied to something. From the object's pers perspective, this person, um, there's been a force exerted on the object. Okay. A force always requires an agent, something that acts or exerts power. So if you throw the ball, and the ball is the object, then you are the agent or cause of the force exerted on the ball. A force is a vector. It, its direction is impor important. Okay. There are two kinds of forces. A contact force is a force that acts on an object by touching it at a point of contact, like this baseball actually touches the baseball bat. And there's long range of forces, forces that act without physical contact, such as the earth is somehow pulling this cup towards, towards it without touching it. Okay. To draw a force vector, first you represent the object as a particle. You just draw a dot. And then you place the tail of the force vector on the dot and draw the force as an arrow pointing in the proper direction with a length proportional to the size of the force. Then you can label the, the arrow. Example, a box is pulled to the right by a rope. Let's draw the force vector. First you draw the box as a dot, then you draw the force vector going towards the right, away from the box dot. A box is pushed to the right by a spring. Okay. Again, first you draw the box as a dot, then you draw, again, the force going towards the right, so you draw it emanating from the, the box and going towards the right. A box is pulled down by gravity. Draw the box as a dot, and then draw downwards force of gravity. You can do combinations of forces. Here's a box that is being pulled by two ropes in different directions. When you have several forces, uh, acting on an object, the net force is the vector sum of all the forces. F net equals the sum from i equals 1 to n of F sub i. So F1 plus F2 plus blah 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 until F sub n. In this case there's only two forces, F sub 1 and F sub 2. So the net force is just the vector sum of these two forces. And here we've used the parallelogram rule to uh, represent the net force in the box, which is down and to the right. And this is called a superposition of forces. Okay, let's go through some of the forces that come up in this chapter and through the rest of the textbook. A uh, very important force is gravity. The pull of any planet on an object which is near the surface of the planet is called the gravitational force. The agent for the gravity force is the entire planet. Every um, mountain and ocean and the iron core of the Earth, all of this contributes uh, to the gravity force on this box. Gravity acts on all objects near the surface of the planet, whether they're moving or they're at rest, and it always points downward. In fact, here on Earth, that's how we define the direction down, is the direction that gravity pulls. A spring uh, can either push if it's compressed. This uh, spring on the left is a little shorter than it wants to be, so it's pushing the box to the right. Or it can pull. Here's a spring which is a little longer than it wants to be, so it's pulling the box to the left. Not all springs are actually metal coils. Whenever any elastic object is flexed or deformed in some way, it springs back to its original shape when you let it go, and this is called a spring force. Tension. Uh, whenever a string or a rope or a wire pulls an object, it exerts a contact force called tension. Here is a sled, here is a rope attached to it. We draw the force vector tension as being up and towards the right. It's in the direction of the string or rope. So the actual uh, microscopic mechanism behind tension is like a spring force. If you think of the rope, uh, it's actually made of many, many uh, small atoms and they're connected by, uh, by the electric force, which is can be modeled as a little tiny spring. So if there is a force on the rope, all these little springs, the horizontal ones, are stretched just slightly. 
and that stretching is what causes the rope to tense up and to have a tension. The normal force. When an object sits on a table, the table exerts an upward force on the object. Here's the physics textbook. Okay, this is uh, the force is perpendicular to the table, and the word for perpendicular when you're talking about uh, surfaces is normal. So this is called the normal force. And sort of like tension, the microscopic reason for normal force, again, it's the it's little springs acting between the atoms. So as the book sits on the table, it compresses all, a lot of little tiny springs between the atoms. They're not really springs, but they're, they're, like a, they're like a spring force. And this pushes upwards. Normal force doesn't have to be up. If the surface is vertical, like uh, a wall, and you place your hand against the wall, then the normal force will be horizontal. Here it's pressing towards the left. If the surface is tilted, here's a frog sitting on an incline, then the normal force, again, it's perpendicular to the surface, so here it's up and to the left. Kinetic friction. When, when an object slides along the surf, a surface, the surface can exert a contact force which opposes the motion. motion. This is called sliding friction or kinetic friction. So here we have a slide moving towards the right, the kinetic friction is tangent to the surface and opposite the velocity of the object relative to the surface. So kinetic friction tends to slow down the sliding motion of the object. It creates heat and dissipates some of this uh, energy of motion into, uh, into thermal energy. Static friction is a contact force that keeps two surfaces stuck together. Once again, the static friction force is directed tangent to the surface. So here the frog is sitting on, it, on an incline. Uh, it wants to slip down the incline, okay, down into the left. So the static friction points opposite to the direction in which the object would move if, it, if there were no static friction. So if this was a slippery surface, the frog would move down to the left. So static friction points up and to the right. Kinetic friction is, as I said, a resistive force which opposes or resists motion. Resistive forces are also experienced by objects that move through fluids, such as air. Okay. The resistive force of a fluid is called drag, and drag points opposite the direction of motion. So here's a lot of leaves, they're falling off a tree, they're moving downwards, so there's a drag force pushing them upwards. Okay. For heavy and compact objects in air, like, not like leaves, but baseballs, the drag force is relatively small compared to gravity. So usually you can neglect air resistance or neglect this drag in all problems unless a problem explicitly asks you to include it. Thrust. So a jet airplane or a, a rocket has a thrust force pushing it forward. Okay. Thrust occurs when an engine expels some gases at high speed. The exhaust exerts a contact force on the engine, which is opposite to the direction that the exhaust is expelled. So here the rocket is pushing gases downwards, so the gases themselves push the rocket upwards. Okay. There are two forces you'll learn about later, mostly in uh, Physics 132, the electric force and the magnetic force. These are long-range forces, and atoms and molecules are made of charged particles, and charged particles exert uh, electric and magnetic forces on one another. So those molecular bonds that we modeled as little springs are actually the electric force. So most forces we've just listed there, like normal force, tension, are actually uh, due to the electric force. Okay, section 5.3, I'd like you to read it. It has mostly some, some examples about uh, how to use forces. Here's section 5.4. What do forces do? Why are we so obsessed with them? Well, imagine we have uh, a block sitting on a frictionless surface, and we attach a rubber band to it, and we stretch the rubber band by some fixed amount. What will happen is that the block will begin to move slowly at first, and as we continue pulling with uh, carefully keeping the rubber band at the same length, it'll speed up and go faster and faster and faster and faster. And it turns out 
that the acceleration of the block is constant as long as we maintain a constant stretch on the rubber band. So let's look at a rubber band. Uh, if we have one rubber band stretched by some standard length, then this will give this some standard force. Okay? And if we were to place some number n side by side rubber bands, we would find that the net force in each finger would increase by this factor n. So here is two rubber bands uh, stretched by the same length. This will exert twice the force on each finger as just one rubber band. So when you have this one kilogram block pulled on a frictionless surface by a single elastic band, you can measure uh, its acceleration. Okay. We might call that A1. And we can plot it even on a graph. Here's A1 for one rubber band. If we use two rubber bands, we would measure that the acceleration is double, twice A1. And three or four or five rubber bands would get a graph something like this which shows that the acceleration is directly proportional to the force. Five times the force, five times the acceleration. Now if we do the same thing with different blocks, so here again is the graph for uh, a one kilogram block accelerates with acceleration A1, and then we use one rubber band but attach it to a two kilogram block, we'll find that it accelerates half as much A1 over two. If we do a three kilogram block, it'll accelerate a third of as much, four kilogram block uh, quarter, A1 over four. So this is a inverse proportionality of acceleration to mass. So the result of the experiment is that acceleration of an object is proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. And we can uh, introduce a unit for force called the Newton, which is one kilogram meters per second squared. If you measure force in Newtons, mass in kilograms, uh, this equation will give you a prediction for acceleration in meters per second squared. Typical forces, uh, weight of a quarter is about uh, five hundredths of a Newton. A one pound object, uh, like an apple or something, uh, would be about five Newtons. A person weighs about 500 Newtons. Uh, a car, the force on a car as it's uh, accelerating, can be around 5,000 Newtons. If you look at a rocket, there could be millions of Newtons pushing on a, ro on a rocket. Okay, an object with twice the amount of matter accelerates only half as much in response to the same force. So somehow, the more matter an object has, the more it resists accelerating uh, in response to the same force. So the tendency of an object to resist change in its velocity is what we call inertia. And so this letter m, the mass in A equals F over m, is called the inertial mass. So chapter 5 ends with an introduction to Newton's first and second laws. We start with Newton's second law. So when more than one force is acting on an object, the object accelerates in the direction of the net force. This also works with one force, okay? But if there's more than one, you have to add up a vector sum of all the forces, and then we see the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force, and it's inversely proportional to the mass. So we can write A, uh, the acceleration A, is equal to the net force vector divided by the scalar mass, and that's Newton's second law. Newton's first law states that an object that is at rest will remain at rest, or an object that is moving will continue to move in a straight line with a constant velocity if and only if the net force acting on the object is zero. This is known as the law of inertia. It just states that if an object is at rest, it has a tendency to stay at rest. If an object is moving, it has a tendency to continue moving with the same velocity. Okay. So an object on which the net force is zero is said to be in mechanical equilibrium. And there's two types of mechanical equilibrium. Up in the top, we have a person who is at rest, 
Okay? The net force on this person is zero, and we call this static equilibrium. It's just going to stay at rest. Here is a skateboarder. As the skateboarder slides along, their net force on the skateboarder is zero. Okay? And so the velocity of the person is constant, and the acceleration is zero. This is called dynamic equilibrium. If a car stops suddenly, you might get thrown forwards towards the steering wheel. You do have a forward acceleration relative to the car. However, there's no force pushing you forward. Okay? So we define an inertial reference frame as one in which Newton's laws are valid. If you're inside a car, this is not an inertial reference frame. Okay? Here is a dummy. This guy thinks there's a force hurling him towards this airbag. But in reality, he's just getting carried along by his inertia, and the car is, ac is accelerating backwards. So here's a physics student cruising along at a constant velocity in an airplane. There's a tennis ball sitting on the floor, and it just stays at rest. There's no horizontal forces acting on the ball, so its acceleration is zero. Newton's first law is satisfied, so we say the airplane is an inertial reference frame. Here's another physics student. They're on the runway, and the pilot is stepping on the gas, and the plane is accelerating, going faster and faster. Okay. He places the tennis ball on the floor, and the ball rolls towards the back of the airplane. Okay. There's no horizontal forces on the ball, okay. and yet the ball accelerates in the plane's reference frame. This means Newton's first law is violated, therefore the airplane is not an inertial reference frame. In general, any reference frame that is accelerating is not an inertial reference frame. So every force has an agent which causes, causes a force, and forces exist at the point of contact between the agent and the object, except for gravity and a few other long-range forces. Forces exist due to interactions that are happening now, not what happened in the past. Consider this flying arrow. A pushing force was required to accelerate the arrow <clears throat> as it was shot, but after it leaves the bow, it continues more moving forward as it flies. It continues moving forward not because of any forces, but because of its own inertia. The last section in chapter 5 is mostly examples, 5.7. I'd like to, you to read that.